Hi everyone, in this video we will be talking about lab safety, specifically infection control and biosafety. Let's first take a look at some widely accepted safety standards. The first one is the OSHA Bloodborne Pathogen Standard. This is a set of regulations that require employers to protect employees from bloodborne pathogens. The standard includes a determination of tasks and procedures that may result in an occupational hazard, as well as a plan to investigate all exposure incidents and a plan to prevent these from reoccurring. The standard also regulates that there should be methods of compliance for standard precautions. In addition, employers should also have engineering and work practice controls personal protective equipment or PPE for their employees, guidelines for ensuring that the work site is maintained in a clean and sanitary manner, as well as guidelines for the handling and disposal of regulated waste. And finally, the standard stipulates that there should be a training program for all employees. Then we have the standard precautions, which were introduced by the CDC or Centers for Disease Control and Prevention. The main guideline is that blood and body fluids from all patients be considered infectious and capable of transmitting disease. This can include synovial fluid, CSF, and other body fluids, except for sweat. Some of the stipulations included in standard precautions include hand washing, which should be done after touching blood and other body fluids, as well as any items considered contaminated. Hand washing should also be done after removal of gloves and in between patients. Next, gloves should be worn when handling anything considered contaminated, and clean gloves must be put on before touching mucous membranes and non-intact skin. Mask, eye protection, or face shield should also be worn anytime there is a potential for splashes or sprays of blood, body fluids, secretions, and excretions. Laboratory coats must also be worn to protect skin and clothing when in contact with blood, body fluids, secretions, and other excretions. Sharps must also be properly disposed to prevent injuries. Appropriate puncture-resistant containers should be used for this purpose. Finally, we have environmental controls, which must include procedures for routine care, cleaning, and disinfection of environmental surfaces. Next, let's talk about transmission-based precautions, which are added to standard precautions when there is known or suspected handling of infectious agents that require extra measures to prevent spread or transmission of the agent. Included in transmission-based precautions are contact precautions, which aim to stop the spread of infectious agents that may be transmitted through direct or indirect contact. Then we have droplet precautions, which are aimed against agents that can be transmitted by close respiratory contact or by exposure of mucous membranes to respiratory secretions. And we also have airborne precautions, which are geared to stop the spread of infectious agents that remain airborne and infectious over long distances. Then we have engineering controls, which are controls that isolate or remove the hazard from the workplace. Examples of these include emergency showers or eye wash stations, which can be seen in the lower picture, shield barriers, negative pressure, and biosafety cabinets, an example of which is in the upper picture. We also have work practice controls, which are designed to alter the way a task is performed to reduce the likelihood of exposure to infectious agents. Examples of these controls include rules that state no mouth pipetting, no eating, drinking, smoking, or applying cosmetics in the laboratory, disinfection of workstations, no recapping or breaking of contaminated needles, as well as frequent hand washing. Then we have personal protective equipment, which is a specialized clothing or equipment that is worn by an employee for protection. Examples of these include lab gowns, face masks, and gloves. It is important to note that PPE must fit properly to be most effective, and some PPE, like respirators, may require fit testing. Let's next talk about risk group classification of infectious agents. 
Agents are classified by the World Health Organization based on their ability to infect and cause disease in humans or animals, their virulence, the availability of treatments for the disease, and the availability of preventive measures such as vaccines. There are four risk groups. First, risk group one, which are for agents with no or low individual and community risk. Usually, these are non-pathogenic organisms like Lactobacillus and Bifidobacterium. Next, we have risk group two, which are agents with moderate individual risk and low community risk. Examples of these are laboratory isolates like E. coli, Streptococcus, and Staphylococcus. Then we have risk group three, which are agents with high individual risk but low community risk. Usually, these include exotic agents like Mycobacterium tuberculosis, the causative agent of the respiratory disease tuberculosis. It is important to note that organisms in risk group three, risk group two, and risk group one have effective treatment and preventive measures available. Then we have risk group four. These agents have high individual and community risk and usually do not have effective treatment and preventive measures available. Examples include the Ebola virus and the Lassa fever virus. We also have various biosafety levels. These levels usually correlate with the risk group classification, but are not always equal. A biological risk assessment is needed to assess the proper biosafety levels needed for specific agents. Included in this assessment is the identification of hazards associated with an infectious agent or material, then identification of the activities that might cause exposure to the agent or the material, the competencies and experience of laboratory personnel, then an evaluation of risks that would cause an LAI or lab-acquired infection, and the severity of the consequences if such infection occurs. And finally, the development, implementation, and evaluation of controls to minimize the risk for exposure. The lowest biosafety level is Biosafety Level 1 or BSL1. Laboratories classified under this level usually deal with agents that are well classified and are not known to cause disease in healthy adults. These agents also pose a minimal threat to laboratory personnel and the environment. Some guidelines in BSL-1 facilities include restricted access to the laboratory, hand washing rules, basic work practice controls, OSHA guidelines for handling needles and sharps, decontamination after completion of work at any time there has been a spill, wearing of PPEs, an insect and rodent control plan, and the laboratory facility should be designed so that it can easily be cleaned. Then we have Biosafety Level 2 or BSL-2. And these are facilities for agents that pose a moderate potential hazard for employees and the environment. The guidelines in a BSL-2 are the same as BSL-1 plus the following. Employees have a specific and updated training in the handling of a pathogenic agent. Access to the laboratory is also limited when work is being conducted. Employees should have immunizations or tests for agents handled. Then, biosafety manuals are developed and kept updated in the laboratory. A biosafety cabinet, recommended class 2, must also be used in the laboratory. All PPE are also required, and extreme precautions should be taken when handling contaminated sharp items. Then we have the Biosafety Level 3 or BSL-3 laboratory. These are for agents that are either indigenous or exotic and have the potential for aerosol transmission and cause diseases that may be lethal. Guidelines for BSL-3 are the same as BSL-2 plus the following. Handling of infectious materials, samples, and cultures must occur within a biosafety cabinet or other physical containment device. This type of laboratory should also be separated from other parts of the building and must have a negative pressure in the room. 
ceilings and floors must be solid and any seams must be sealed. And the facility must also be constructed for easy cleaning and decontamination. Finally, we have the Biosafety Level 4 or BSL-4 facility, which are for agents which have a high risk of causing life-threatening infection, can be transmitted by aerosols, or have an unknown risk of transmission. Rules in a BSL-4 are the same as a BSL-3, plus the following. Personnel must demonstrate high proficiency in standard and special microbiology practices. Policies and procedures are established on the collection and storage of serum samples from at-risk personnel. Then, personnel enter and exit the laboratory through a clothing change room. When personnel leave the laboratory, they must completely change clothes and shower. The clothes are then decontaminated before being laundered. This type of laboratory has a dedicated non-circulating ventilation system which is filtered through a HEPA filter before being exhausted. And finally, all materials in the BSL-4 laboratory must be decontaminated before leaving the facility. The last topic we will be tackling are biosafety cabinets. There are three types of biosafety cabinets. The first is class one. These cabinets allow room or unsterilized air to pass into the cabinet and the area surrounding the material within, sterilizing only the air to be exhausted. These cabinets also have negative pressure. As you can see in this figure, room air is able to enter the cabinet and it is sterilized before it is released back into the room. Here are some examples of class 1 biosafety cabinets. Then we have the class 2 biosafety cabinet, which are cabinets that sterilize the air that flow over the infectious material as well as the air to be exhausted. These cabinets utilize vertical laminar flow, which serve as a barrier to particles from the outside of the cabinet and direct the flow of contaminated air into the filters. There are two main types of class 2 biosafety cabinets. The first is a class 2A cabinet, which is self-contained and releases exhaust into the room. Meanwhile, the class 2B cabinet discharges the exhaust outside the building. Here are some examples of class 2 biosafety cabinets. As you can see, the class 2A biosafety cabinet does not have a dedicated exhaust. While for the class 2B, it has a small exhaust that is meant to be connected to the outside of the building. The final and most secure type of biosafety cabinet is the class 3 biosafety cabinet. This type of cabinet is completely enclosed and has negative pressure. Air coming in and going out of the cabinet is filter sterilized. And the infectious material within is usually handled with rubber gloves that are attached and sealed to the cabinet. Here are some examples of class 3 biosafety cabinet. As you can see, there are rubber gloves attached to each cabinet. And there is a separate entryway for the infectious material. If you want to know more about the things discussed in this lecture, please check out these references.